Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of China. Now just by looking at this map, you can see that this is only half of China, just the western half. So we'll look at the eastern half on the other page and then we'll go over its history and then we will flip through this book. But let me put it aside just for a moment so we can look at the borders. So to start off, we have a border here with North Korea. This border is with Russia. Sorry, my arm's jostling the camera. <laughs> this is the border with Mongolia. And then over here, we have border with Kazakhstan. We have, and then down here, we have this border with Kyrgyzstan. Border with Tajikistan, it's a little bit disputed. A tiny, tiny border with Afghanistan. This is the border with Pakistan. This border with India also has dispute right here. This is the border with Nepal and Bhutan. A little bit of India there. And a little more over here, this whole section of Arunachal Pradesh is also um, hotly contested between the two countries. We have a border here with Myanmar, and the rest of the borders we'll see on the other half of the map. So just by looking at this, you can really tell that this landscape is very varied. Lots of different regions and climates and things on this map. The area over here is mostly dominated by a couple of landmarks. First off, we have the Gobi Desert, a very big, dry, grassy, sandy desert, which dominates this area known as Inner Mongolia, among other places. It stretches pretty far out. As we head out here, there's a spot right here known as the Turpan Depression. This is the lowest point in China, passing over some big rocky mountains. We enter the Talak Makan Desert over here. This region is known as the Xingang Uyghur area. So when you hear about the Uyghur people in the news, this is where they live. There's also lots of oil in this area as well. So very important to China. They want to control that as much as possible. There are also lots of mountains that dominate this part of China. Just over here, you can see the Tian Shan Mountains going over there, the Kutun Shan Mountains in the south. That flows into the Karakoram Range, where we have K2, the second highest peak in the world. And then down here, we have the Tibetan Plateau, which you can see is very, very lumpy due to the Himalayan mountains right here. So down here is India, Nepal, and Bhutan. And up here is the region known as Tibet, which we're going to have a whole video on Tibet coming up later this week. So just hold on to any thoughts about Tibet. We'll talk about it later. These two regions are crashing together and creating gigantic Himalayan mountains, including the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, is right here. So, amidst all of that crashing together in slow motion, we get all of this very interesting rocky landscape. And you can see there's also lots of lakes dotting this area. The region is so rocky and different from the rest of the world that it's hard for the snow melts to come down. So it just kind of pools down in various lakes. Isn't that interesting? And it creates a lot of river sources in the other half of China as well. Lots more mountains down here in near Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. And then as we make our way up, you can see some of the green area and some more really incredible mountain ranges. But up here in this area is a region that's historically known as Manchuria. And it's much different than the rest of western China in that it's much greener, a lot more hilly, and a lot more suitable for farmland. Whereas over here, not so much. Let me flip over to the next page. We have to move the book and then move this book to 
to look at Eastern China. There we go. I'm going to set this over here. Perfect. All right. So Eastern China, you can already see the difference in that this area is incredibly green. Most of the area here is fed by many, many rivers flowing off from that Tibetan Plateau, Himalayas area, not to mention some from the north coming up from Siberia to coming down. So this area is very green, very fertile, and very rocky and mountainy with some very interesting types of kind of soft limestone rock. Lots of different formations all throughout. If you've seen the film Avatar by James Cameron, a lot of the alien landscapes of that movie was based on this area of China. Lots of tall pillars and cliffs and remarkable places. This area right here is known as the... It's, I don't know what is that. Let me see my notes. Sichuan Pendi? That's not how I have it written down. Um, I have it written down as, let's see, oh, I didn't write it down. <laughs> um, this area is known for its lois, I think it's pronounced lois, lois, um, soil, very soft and very fertile. That soft fertile from this valley here flows into the rivers and washes all of that soil down and creates even more fertile land. Why didn't I write this down? It's in the book here. I'll show it. I probably didn't write it down because it was in the book. Anyway, the main rivers dominating this area are the Yangtze, which it's really hard to see the rivers. It flows here and then out this way. And you can see many, many major cities along the river as well. There's big Shanghai, Nanjing. There's Wuhan and Chongqing, among so many different other cities. As you can see, these are all, all these dots you see are major cities, like major skyscraper, massive buildings. The Yellow River comes down this way and flows out to here. It's another very important river. And it's known as the Yellow River because it's full of that lowest sediment and turns it yellow. There is a canal which is not on this map that links the Yellow River to the Yangtze called the Grand Canal. It's the world's longest canal. And we also have on the Yangtze River the Three Gorges Reservoir, where the Three Gorges Dam is located. It's the world's largest power station. Looking at the coast here, let's go south and head up. Actually, no, let's go north. You can see some of the various bays and seas of the area. This is Buhai, and this is the big yellow sea. And then we have the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And here we have the island of Taiwan, which I'm also going to have a whole video about coming later this week. But we'll definitely talk about Taiwan and its history. It's separated from mainland China by the Taiwan Strait. Down here we have these regions, Hong Kong and Macau. They do their own thing, they have their own languages, currencies, governments, but they are a part of China. Hong Kong is a big business area. Macau is very much like Las Vegas in terms of gambling and resorts and luxury. There's also a big island down here called Hainan, and it's like a vacation. It's like the Jeju Island is to South Korea. Hainan is to China, or in more Western terms, Hawaii is to the United States. It's the vacation spot. You can see right here in the Gulf of Tonkin. And I believe that's it. Oh, I didn't do the borders for this area. So we have this long border with Myanmar, the border with Laos, and Vietnam. The last few borders there. And you can see the rest of the border with North Korea up here. Let me check my notes one more time to make sure I got everything that I wanted to mention. I think I did. I listed more rivers, but you can... It's very hard to see the rivers on this map. It's even harder on my big atlas, because there's just so many, 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 many cities. Alright, let me...
put my notes over and let's get into history. So people have been living in what's now China for a very long time. I'm going to move this back over here. For a very, very, very long time. The most famous ancient person that's been found is Peking Man. He would have lived sometime between 680 to 780,000 years ago. The early humans that lived here were very intelligent. They had their own writing system. It was very different from the writing system in China today, but nonetheless, they were creating advanced caveman civilizations, I suppose. And those led to the dynasties. Now, the, dynast the dynastic families are very, very important to Chinese history. The first one, though, may not have actually existed. It may have been a mythological dynasty. Think King Arthur, right? It's, was King Arthur real? Was he not? Who knows? Same goes for the Xia dynasty. If the Xia dynasty were real, they would have been around at like 2100 BCE or so, the first great dynasty founded by Yi the Great. But following them, the first real dynasty that we know of was the Shang dynasty from about the 17th to 11th centuries BCE, and they created the first forms of very early Chinese writing that we know of, that looks like the Chinese writing we know today. Following the fall of the Shang dynasty was the Zhou dynasty from the 11th to 5th centuries BCE. And it flourished for quite a bit until it didn't. The, the Zhou's were all about spreading out their territory by appointing people to be in charge of every piece of territory. And those people got big heads, decided that they were better rulers, and the kingdom fractured and created an era known as the Warring States period, wherein all the states were warring with each other. But in 221 BCE, a man who in history is known as Shi Huangdi united all the states and created the Qin Dynasty, led by Qin Shi Huangdi or Qin Shi Huang. He united China for a very brief moment until he passed away, and he did quite a couple of really incredible things for Chinese's historical legacy in that the terracotta warriors were buried in his tomb. And he also began construction of the Great Wall, which is what I forgot to show you on the map. I knew I was forgetting something. You can see part of it over here. There's a lot more on the other map going into this territory. But he began what would eventually become the Great Wall of China, though most of the parts that he commissioned aren't around anymore. Let's see, after he passed his dynasty went with him and that led to the rise of the han dynasty which is very important because most people who identify as chinese especially the people that live in this region identify as ethnically han chinese so this is when we see chinese culture begin as we know it today the han dynasty really flourished off of Confucianism, which started way before this, but this is when the ball really started to get rolling in terms of Confucianism, which is not a religion, it's a way of running society in a hierarchical position where the emperor comes before everyone else, the family, the father comes before everyone else, and so, so on and so forth, you know, teachers over students, things like that various different forms of social hierarchies. Buddhism also was the main religion during this time. It was introduced way before this, but it started to flourish during this time. And also this is when the Silk Road began and trade was happening between the lands in the west and China in the east, with paths sneaking through all of those mountains that we saw to reach other lands to trade various goods, and it was called the Silk Road because the Chinese had created silk, which the Westerners had no idea how they made. 
I would have never guessed that it came from like worm thread that was dried and all of that. Very complicated making silk. The Han Dynasty would eventually split, split into three, creating the Three Kingdoms period. The one dynasty that would rise out of that, one of the kingdoms that would overcome all of them, was the Jin Dynasty. However, that also ended in a civil war, and they were united by the Sui Dynasty. The Sui Dynasty constructed the Grand Canal between the two rivers to increase trade. And as the Sui Dynasty fell from grace, the Tang Dynasty, or Tang Dynasty as they're sometimes known in the West, rose up, and this was a big powerhouse of a dynasty. I should say, if you don't know what a dynasty is, it's also pronounced dynasty in other parts of the English-speaking world. It's a, a clan of families, a clan of rulers. So, for example, over in England, technically, that's the Windsor dynasty, you know? So it's a line of families that ruled. A line of rulers that were families. Anyway trade exploded in this area in all directions. The Silk Road was revitalized. There is sea trade in the south, a spreading of culture all throughout Eastern Asia. Let's see what else. Lots of arts. The arts in this area really, really took off as well. Following the Tang Dynasty was the Song Dynasty. Um, paper has been around in China for a long time after this, but this is when paper money was first invented, along with gunpowder. There was a woman empress named Wu Zetian for a minute, one of the boss babes of history. <laughs> However, that all collapsed thanks to the Mongols who invaded in 1205 and ransacked everything as they went. The grandson of Genghis Khan, the leader of the Mongols, his name was Kublai Khan, he came and established his own dynasty called the Yuan Dynasty. Or Yuan Dynasty, it's very hard to pronounce. But they controlled it until the people rose up and another strong family kicked out the Mongols and created the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty is another, I wrote in my notes, another art era, which is true. Ming Chinese art is absolutely gorgeous and is prized the world over to this day. Also, the capital was moved to Beijing, which, did I point that out in history, in geography? Did I point out Beijing? I don't think I did. I think I just pointed out Shanghai. Okay, yeah, I didn't point out Beijing. I just checked my notes. Beijing is up here capitals moved to Beijing, and this is when the Forbidden City was constructed, which was this absolutely, which is, it's still there, this absolutely massive palace complex for the emperor to live in and rule and live very fancily. The Manchu people from Manchuria, remember that area up here, invaded in 1644. They established their own dynasty called the Qing Dynasty, and it would be the last dynasty of China. This was when um, opium really took off among the Chinese, a, a very relaxing drug, and the Qing Dynasty banned it, which meant that the British saw pound signs in their eyes and said, we can sell you opium, we've got lands where we can grow opium over here, we'll sell it to you. And that sparked the opium wars. There were two opium wars fought with the UK and France which um, China lost, and Hong Kong wound up being taken over by the British during this time. Macau, for the longest time, was in control by the Portuguese, who had been there for, like I said, a very long time. But the British took Hong Kong as their own port city, as the spoils of victory. These, these wars were incredibly unpopular with the Chinese people, you can imagine. There had been many different riots and revolts and protests before that, but it really started to pick up at this time. And it got even worse after warring happened with Japan, and Japan took over Taiwan, the spoils of its war. A diaspora began during this time with 
Chinese people leaving China and spreading out all around the world, which if you've been to any Chinatown in any major city, particularly the one that I live in in San Francisco, um, that's when these towns were created, the, the Chinatowns around the world, I mean. There was a massive revolution in 1911 to 1912, which overthrew the Qing dynasty and ended it completely. Sun Yat-sen, as his name is pronounced in the West, was the leader of this rebellion. He led the new government known as the Republic of China. He would step down not long after that, and Chiang Kai-shek would be in charge, trying to start a brand new government here in China. But there was a huge communist movement happening in China as well, who wanted to get rid of that government and implement a communist one. There was a civil war with this group, and um, many horrible things start happening in Chinese history at this point, I should note, and I'm not glossing over them, I'm not diminishing them, I'm not making light of them, I'm just briefly mentioning some very horrible things in Chinese history, and moving on for the sake of relaxation, and for the sake of YouTube monetization. One of the horrible things that happened was the Long March, in which many um, Republic of Chinese people were forced out of their homes into the West on foot, which you saw the landscape. Pretty horrendous. But eventually, that civil war would come to a very abrupt end in 1937 when Japan invaded thus officially sparking World War II in the Pacific. In particular, one of the horrendous things they did was the takeover of Nanjing or Nanking, which is where I'm going to end that because that was a very horrendous thing that happened when they pretty much bulldozed the city. Well, not physically, but emotionally, I suppose. Absolutely destroying the people of that city among many others, but that's the one that's the most famous. Much later, after the end of World War II, on October 1st, 1949, the communists would win out in the Civil War, and their leader, Mao Zedong, would declare the People's Republic of China. So the Republic of China, the, the government that was in place before, they had fled to Taiwan, and had set up their own government here, which, um, after it was taken from the Japanese during World War II, they had moved here and declared the island the Republic of China. And they were forced to stay there as the People's Republic of China was declared. And this created the era of the two Chinas, since both countries went by the name China. Uh, it led to some really confusing things politically, but both sides insisted that they were the real China. In 1950, the People's Republic of China invaded the country of Tibet, claiming that they were um, helping these backwards people, but in reality they were just taking over a very anti-communist region that was near them. And like many other communist areas in Asia at this time, um, they implemented some policies that were meant to create prosperity in China, mainly in terms of agriculture and culture in general. The first one was known as the Great Leap Forward, which was, in a nutshell, a form of collectivization and farming, and uh, it led to the world's largest famine in history. It was very, very bad, and things became very, very unpopular in China, so in 1966, the communist government launched the Cultural Revolution, which was sort of like the Great Leap Forward, but more intense. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to... You know, my landlady is from China, and she was telling me one day... Hello, Anne, if you're watching this. <laughs> she was telling me one day that she used to study math in school, and she loved math, she loved algebra and calculus, and then once the Cultural Revolution began, she was forced out of school, forced out of her home, and forced to work in the fields. So that kind of tells you <laughs> what the Cultural Revolution was like. Um, after Mao Zedong died, 
the government began to reform because people were obviously not happy with what was going on. They created a new mixed economy, so sort of communism in name, but capitalist in practice. They implemented quite a few different things, the most famous being the one-child policy in 1980. Since there are so many people in China, there's still a lot of people in China, it's the most populous country in the world, they said everyone can only have one child, which they eventually uh, took that away a couple of years ago and made it two child because it created a lot of problems. The protests against the governments had been boiling, boiling, boiling up, and it led to the big 1989 Tiananmen Square protest up in Beijing, which if you see that image of the man standing in front of the tanks, that's what that is. That would lead to the 1990s being a huge prosperity boom in terms of industrialization. Um, that's why everything you have is made in China. It's, yeah, it's, there is a lot of industry happening at that time, a big swing and focus on not so much agriculture, but manufacturing. The British returned Hong Kong in 1997. And uh, Portugal returned Macau in 1999, which essentially ended the era of empires. No more colonies in the world, like, like how there used to be, I should say. So what's going on today? Well, quite a lot. <laughs> We're here to start. Taiwan is still an issue. Taiwan was essentially controlled by the Americans after World War II, but they kind of let Taiwan do their own thing. So it was a very Western style way of living, economy, way of life. And when it was returned to China, and I believe it was 1999, there's been conflicts ever since. You know, I think Taiwan's capitulated in terms of, you know, we're not the China. But China says, no, we are the China. We really don't care what you say as long as you don't say you are anything like China. You're just a part of China. And uh, there's been many, 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 many huge protests in Taiwan against China. They still call themselves the Republic of China, by the way. They, Like I said, they've kind of capitulated on saying they're the only China. But any country that recognizes Taiwan as being its own thing is condemned in the eyes of China. The Olympic Committee, unsure of what to do with this, calls this island the uh, Chinese Taipei, officially in the Olympics. You can see the capital city there of Taipei. So there's that. There's also um, the Uyghur people I told you about. They are very different from the Han Chinese in that they are Muslim and um, look very much like they're from Central Asia, not Eastern Asia. They are definitely not Han Chinese. Many of those people, because like I said, there is a lot of oil over there and the Chinese really want to control that oil. They've been crowding the Uyghur people into camps to re-educate them, to make them more pro-Chinese and anti-Muslim which has been a huge outrage around the world, as you can imagine. Uh, China insists that this is not happening at all and that these people are delight delighted to be there. Um, a lot of them, um, you know, it's really sad to say, but if you bought masks during the pandemic that had the little Chinese slip in them, it's likely that it came from that part of China. They're put to work and forced to um, love China, not their old culture. Same goes for the Falun Gong, which is, I'm not going to get into that either. Same with the Christian community in China, various forms of persecution, not to mention the Tibetans have been, have been since 1950 undergoing very strict persecution. It's quite a lot. Um, China has ex been expanding its influence into the South Pacific islands over here. Um, kind of throwing money at countries, telling them don't recognize Taiwan and we'll 
pay you all this money. Um, the, the thing is, is that the U.S. has a lot of bases in those islands, and the U.S. is saying, oh, you really shouldn't do that because that's our sphere of influence. China keeps doing it anyway. Kind of, you know, gently poking the tiger to see if anything happens. It's a little interesting politically. Not to mention, COVID-19 began in the city of Wuhan and spread around the world. China is, at this point in 2022, in my opinion, this is my opinion, this sentence is my opinion, this is the only country that's doing anything about COVID still in 2022, but the way that they're doing things about COVID are very extreme. Their policy is known as the zero COVID policy, and if anything COVID related is detected in an area, the government shuts it down immediately. So people being trapped in restaurants and movie theaters and schools or their homes, unable to leave for two weeks until it's cleared. It's very intense, but they really seem to be the only country that's doing anything about COVID. Everyone else just seems to do, you know, just live your lives and good luck. China at least is doing something, but oh boy, is it extreme, you know? Um, yeah. So anyway, that is where China is today in the briefest nutshell that I can describe China today in, oh boy. There's a lot more layers upon all of these things, but we don't have time to get into those tonight. Plus, I don't want to because they're not very fun to talk about. They're really kind of a downer. So let's flip through the book and look at some amazing pictures of China. Isn't that sweet? Every book I checked out about China is very sticky. Look at the old fishermen with their cormorants there that they use to fish. They dive in and get the fish. And you can see some of the uh, beautiful rocky mountain landscapes I was trying to describe but cannot because they're just so stunning. There's a lion <laughs> and the person controlling the lion puppet there. But yeah, it's very sticky. <laughs> This is in Shanghai, isn't that beautiful? And a silk shop. Look at all of the silks there. Here's the political map of China, and you can really see here just how many people live in this half as opposed to this half. There's Mao Zedong there talking to a group of people. And some sweet faces there. And the beautiful countryside. So here's what that East China landscape is like. Very fertile, grassy fields, rice fields, and these incredible jagged mountains. So, so beautiful. Here's the Himalayas. And here's the Gobi Desert. Oops, there. Physical map. Let's see, the Sichuan Basin, that's the place I was thinking of, that like my map calls it what? Oh, Sichuan Pendi, yeah, I was like, that's not right, Sichuan Basin, that's the word I was looking for. The gorgeous mountains here, like I really can't describe how beautiful these mountains are, they're so picturesque. Sadly though, those beautiful mountains are created because of very shaky land formations which creates a lot of earthquakes. And with so many people living in China, the death tolls of these earthquakes are extensive. The Yangtze River, you can see, um, you know, the coloring of the river, that's from that Lewis soil. And this is the Yangtze River flooding the city of Wuhan in 1931. Looks pretty bad. You know, if you gotta break out the boats, that's a bad flood. And this is the Lois here, the rocky, rocky Lois with lots of rice growing on them. Fishing in the lake here. And this was another thing I didn't mention that's happening in modern day China is the air pollution. It's the worst air quality in the world. The government has been working to improve it in the last few years. 
as in like the last five years or so, but the air is still not great. Look at this. This is in Harbin. Harbin is a very cold northern city and they have an ice festival. And it's very rainy here, probably um, the wake of a typhoon maybe. Speaking of, that's what a typhoon looks like. Here we have some big cities. Let's see, this is Shanghai for sure. Yeah, Shanghai, you can see the big tower there. And this beautiful building down here, which is <laughs> McDonald's, um, is in the city of Guangzhou. Isn't this the most beautiful duck you've ever seen? A mandarin duck. It's, there's so much to it, it's, it's so beautiful. The national flower, I think. The plum blossom. And this gorgeous bamboo forest, isn't that so peaceful? And beautiful ginkgo trees as well. And we've got some yaks over here, and look at this guy. The golden snub-nosed monkey. Are you kidding me? That is so cute. <laughs> they are so cute. And of course the iconic giant panda. The most famous animal to come out of China. And one that's very, very protected by the Chinese government. A beautiful endangered snow leopard up there. And the really incredible red-crowned crane. Very beloved bird in this part of Asia. Look at this. This is a hook from the 4th century BCE. And you can tell that it was so intricately detailed back in its day. You can still see a lot of details today. Let's see, this is another very beautiful. This is a mug. It looks a lot like the mugs we use today because this is the handle. That's where you drink out of. Isn't that incredible? Here's an ancient archaeological site being dug up. This is Shimao. There's Confucius. And this is Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China. And there's the Great Wall. Isn't that so remarkable? Here's a map of the Great Wall of China. Well, that's left of it at least. And here is his terracotta army, at least part of it. There's so many more, and they're so beautiful. Every single statue is unique. Every single statue is an individual. Here are some travelers on the Silk Road. And let's see, oh, this is the Grand Canal. It's really beautiful. This is the Emperor's boat, it says. Wow. Some art from the Tang Dynasty, which I told you is really incredible art. This is a teapot from the Song Dynasty. Really lovely. I've never seen Chinese art that's just pure white with no designs on it. Especially since the Ming would have absolutely covered this in like flowers and vines and stuff. Intricate detailed porcelain art. This is some movable type because the Chinese invented um, publishing as we know it today, but um, it was the Germans, Johannes Gutenberg, that really like made a mass production of it. So, anyway, you can see how far the Mongol Empire spread and reached most of China here. Let's see, this is in Guangzhou. There's a British guy here selling some stuff to the merchants. And let's see, this is during one of the rebellions known as the Boxer Rebellion. We've got lots of soldiers there, do you see? This is Sun Yat-sen. And let's see, a civil war between the nationalists and communists, and then up there was just the Manchurians, controlled by Japan. There's Mao Zedong giving a speech, and this is... Um, a very striking image, isn't it? They're all holding his little red book, which was like his doctrine in a way. Like his um, manifesto. This is the Tiananmen Square protest. You can see the Forbidden City in the background there. Absolutely massive. And look at this. The communist... Um, Oh, let's see. It's a meeting of the Communist Party in Beijing, the dominant political party. 
casting her vote there. This is the current president of China, um, Xi Jinping. And here's the Congress. They're getting tea served to them. Isn't that nice? Oh man, this book is weirdly sticky. <laughs> the Supreme Court justices here. And is this not gorgeous? This is Macau. Absolutely luxurious gambling. Chinese people are not allowed to gamble. So this is all for foreigners. All the various regional governments. So the green are autonomous. I pointed out some of them to you. The purple here, or the pink I should say, is their special regions. And then municipalities like Beijing. Big march there in the military. And here's the flag of China. Let's read about it. Let me grab a pencil. It says China's national flag has a red field. In the upper left corner is a large yellow star. The star is surrounded in a semicircle by four smaller yellow stars. The large star represents the communist revolution. Four smaller stars represent the unity of the people of China under the Chinese Communist Party. Zhang Lansong, a citizen of Zhejiang province, province, designed the flag in 1949. The first flag was raised in Beijing's Tiananmen Square on October 1st, 1949, at a ceremony proclaiming the founding of the People's Republic of China. And here is Beijing, there's the Forbidden City, and you can see in the map here of the capital just how, like, you can see why it's called the Forbidden City. It is completely huge here, you can see the moat around it. Down here is Tiananmen Square, lots of other government buildings, and the huge park there. I really want to go there someday. I've said this before a couple times on my channel, but I recently watched the movie The Last Emperor, which was about the Qing Dynasty. I loved that movie. It was so good. This guy's got a bunch of bamboo that he's moving, probably to make construction out of it. There's their money. Their money is called the renminbi, but it's also referred to as the yuan. The yuan being their word for, like, dollar. Selling fruits at the market. I'm not skipping any pages. No, no, nothing stuck together. This is Beijing. Isn't that incredible? And then look at this kindly old man weighing some apricots here. It's really sweet. Oh, they're working hard making some steel. And here's a resources map. You can just see how plentiful this half is as opposed to this half. And laying out some fish there, doing some aquaculture, I believe. This is the richest self-made woman. She's worth $9.4 billion at the time of this publication, which was a few years ago. So she's probably much more than... She owns a company that makes touchscreens. And uh, the high-speed train. I think it's the fastest in the world, right? I'm sure someone will correct me if not, but um, please do. Very busy day, one billion plus people. <laughs> a cute family with their little suite there. And another very lovely face. Kind little lady, she's from the Zhuang culture. And this man is a, a Uyghur goat farmer from the looks of it. So you can really see how, like, this man is Chinese, but not ethnically even a little bit, right? They're completely different. These are some Tibetan children. You can see that they are also very different from um, Han Chinese as well. And she's from the Heje culture. There's over, like, 40-something cultures in China. What is she doing? She's using these fish to make... Um, art. Oh, okay, I see. Interesting. And learning how to write the traditional way with the ink and the bowl and the brush and everything. 
Isn't this beautiful? This is a Taoist temple. Really neat, really beautiful building. And saying some prayers here in the temple. And here are some Christians, which Christianity in China is really taking off. And um, it says it down here too. I also read it somewhere else that by 2030, they expect China to become the largest Christian nation in the world. Look at this. A, this is the Temple of Confucius, it says. Isn't that remarkable? And some Buddhist monks here chanting and praying. Look at this very ancient carvings from way back in China's history. And the gorgeous Chinese dragon from mythology. Beautiful, beautiful dancing. The traditional jan dances in China are on a whole other level. Along with their incredible artwork. Is that not amazing? And a nice museum here showing off a Buddha statue, at least the head of it. Ai Weiwei, a very, very famous artist. Um, he filled up this whole room with fake sunflower seeds. It's kind of like the art exhibits he used to do. <laughs> and doing some paper crafting here as well. Am I confusing Ai Weiwei with I Am Pei? So I know I am, I think it was I Am Pei that passed away. I can't remember if I passed away. This is really pretty. This talks about poetry. Shall we read a poem? At least a translation of Feelings of Watching the Moon. I haven't read this, by the way, so let's read it together. The times are hard. A year of famine has emptied the fields. What year was this, by the way? Very long ago. The times are hard. A year of famine has emptied the fields. My brothers live abroad, scattered west and east. Now fields and gardens are scarcely seen after the fighting. Family members wander, scattered on the road, attached to shadows like geese ten thousand li apart, or roots uplifted into September's autumn air. We look together at the bright moon, and then the tears fall. This night, our wish for home can make five places one. Oh, that's really beautiful. <laughs> And to think that that was written so long ago and that could have been written, you know, at least the sentiments around it could have been written about a hundred years ago or even more recent. Just that's a universal feeling, right? Your family leaving and spreading out, missing them. Chinese opera. And playing some music. Um, let's see. Gu Qin, I believe. And playing some basketball. <laughs> and here's Yao Ming, definitely the most famous basketball player in China. Also, ping pong or table tennis is a huge sport in China. They really dominate the sport worldwide. <laughs> they're out for... It looks like they're on the ice, on a bicycle. <laughs> I guess that's fun. Egg drop soup. Next time you have a bad cold, get some of this instead of chicken soup. So good. Making some traditional noodles here. Mmm, and eating some dumplings. Yum, yum. And some fried food in the wok. Oh my gosh. What a sweet. Oh, I love babies. If you can't tell if you've seen my channel. <laughs> I adore babies. Working hard in school. <laughs> Maybe not working too hard. <laughs> At least trying to. New Year's celebration. Isn't that remarkable? And this is at the Dragon Boat Festival. A big boat race of the dragon boats. Oh, and that's the end of the book. So that is it. Thank you so, so much for watching. I'll have a whispered video about China for you tomorrow. And then, like I said, I'm going to have videos about Taiwan and Tibet for you later in the week. So subscribe so you don't miss out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night.
Good night.